welcome one and all to yet another episode of I Am The Night, the weekly show where Adam Hello. and I break down every episode and movie from Batman, the animated series. This week it's Torch Song, uh, episode 10 from season three and our 89th episode of this show. But Adam, talk to us. What have you been up to and what did you think of this fine, fine piece of entertainment? That's what I've been up to. I've just been very excited to have had a sneak peek at a very impactful and, uh, let's say, prideful slice of DC media, but I can't speak too closely about that. Uh, stay tuned to darknightnews.com. But as for this episode, like, high-stakes, swashbuckling, action-packed episode, even from the drop, there was never a dull, quiet moment. There was always dramatic explosions and damsels and nefarious villainy going on the whole way through. It was a high-action episode. Not only that, a very cleverly written episode full of great one-liners, little mm. hints, little nods, which we'll talk about as the show progresses. But I absolutely loved this one. Mm. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Like you said, visually, this ranks as one of the finest pieces of animation from the entire three seasons of this show for me. Mm, I'd say so. Uh, I've always heard from certain kinds of animators that fire is really hard to animate. I think that's mostly true yeah. for like 3D computer animation, but there's still got to be some complexity to it for 2D paper as well. Um, so yeah, they were able to get the stakes of the size of these pyroclasms off really well. And yeah, it was um, a big spectacle, a big dramatic episode. And lo lots of lovely character touches. We begin the show with a massive billboard showing a, a very attractive young lady with cropped blonde hair called Cassidy who turns out to be one of the main protagonists of the show uh, a rock chick which is fantastic because I was expecting because of this era to be I don't know a Madonna or a pop star but a proper rock singer and funnily enough played by a proper rock singer from the era as well and that's another one of the well we know that this cast list in the show is always brilliant and the funniest part is poor Bruce Wayne being dragged out of his car by the girlfriend of the week who is played by another rock star from the era and bumping into Babs at the concert. And um, it's just brilliant from there on onwards. It's just superb. Yeah, we get like, it shows very quickly and very effectively just the stakes of how popular and how uh, influential this particular rock star is. Um, the, she's the talk of the town by everybody. So we get that context in the great in right away. So that when we eventually cut to her, and we get dropped names of some very familiar characters to us, uh, entrenched comics readers, we know, oh, okay, it's going to be this sort of deal. But that doesn't make the, the uh, episode any less predictable or any less action-packed and fun. So were you like me then when the guy stepped out of the shadows and she said garfield did you immediately know I mean, straight away between the no? title between the title and the name garfield garfield lens five like completely yeah. obvious but uh yeah it's a uh, very welcome very very welcome yeah i mean like, i thought when you heard torch song hmm, torch is that something to do with light it's all possibly dr light and then i thought no fire and then as soon as she said garfield I go, oh oh and then obviously when the manager frank another tip to the era i believe um says lynn's then i thought oh boy mm. because i don't know if you know much about the history of the show that mm. they originally wanted firefly from the beginning from season one but he was deemed too dangerous the whole thing with fire and him being a pyromaniac even though the character had been cast and luckily it's the same actor that plays him, one of my favorite character actors in this episode he was deemed unsuitable for this show but they still managed to get him in finally for the third season. And he does appear later in Justice League and other shows as well, which made me really happy because I love this character. So dude who flies around in a jetpack and sometimes and most of the time shoots fire isn't acceptable. But dude who gets his face melted off by acid is OK, because I've seen other Batman animation shows that have thought Firefly is fine, but haven't had any mention of Two-Face. Yeah, uh. it was because this because of this episode i think that they included firefly more because you don't see really mm. or oh, actually you do kind of you don't really see the consequences of his pyromania um until the very end and how it's affected cassidy which was a brilliant little touch but obviously we'll come to that because that's one of my takeaways from the show so um mm. it's just brilliant and uh, 
vintage Batman, classic Batgirl, but obviously tell me some of your thoughts. Um, yeah, I think that they did a very key classic villain good justice here, uh, especially if it was if it's taken them that long. Um, there's definitely the level of obsession there, uh, and there's the level of genius level intellect, uh, as most of Batman's villains are, unfortunately. Um, obviously, they couldn't necessarily show the extent that you were just saying of how deep his uh, pyromania goes, that he just becomes covered in second and third degree burns. But still, they give him good justice here, and they give him a good, a good showing and a good portrayal. And as a villain, I can always think back to one of the Arkham games, the Arkham Origins, where it's an entire sequence that you have to just like run across the bridge because you can't fight him head on. He's just flaming everything up and it's just a very tense moment in the game. And that's certainly how I and a lot of people my age would remember him. But yeah, uh, a layered character still shown those layers because otherwise it's very easy to just be like, ah, he's just the guy who burns things. It's easy. It's very easy to mishandle a character like that. Absolutely totally agree he has to be handled with care and it, it, it's great from the offset because you can see the animators have made him look and feel sinister and then uh, the voice performance is absolutely perfect as well the level of threat and anger in his voice but still the twinges of affection for Cassidy are there and you can feel that it's really really subtly done but when it comes to <laughs> delivery of lines and dialogue again we might sound like scratch records i've got to give my hats off to kevin conroy and tara strong tara charandoff for this episode for lines like hi i'm a big fan good girl um three muggers two robbers quiet evening well, no, no. Night <laughs> <That> is young. <laughs> no I, I i like that one a lot because that that wasn't just that girl being quippy. That's just a real insight to their life as crime fighters. Yeah. If they're doing, if they're dealing with five, six um, at, attempted petty thefts across a night, and that's quiet for them. Yeah. A, how bad are things in Gotham? And B, what kind of things are they used to where that's quiet and boring? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but then obviously the night is young, and obviously a burning nightclub. But line of the episode has to be, "What are you doing tonight, Barbara?" Same thing we do every night, Pinky. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, I mean, like they're both Warner Brothers IPs, they're allowed to make that reference, but of course, Batman doesn't get it because I feel like Batman doesn't have yeah. uh, would only look into a piece of popular culture for a case. He'd just be like, "What?" And even then, Saturday morning cartoons. I think I don't even think uh, Dick or Tim were ever young enough to watch those. It's uh, brilliant, though. Yeah, no, but it is brilliant. <laughs> It is brilliant because when you unpack the line, trying to take yeah. over the world is the exact opposite of what they want to do. Yeah, but it's I think it's deeper than that. It's a psychological thing because Pinky and the Brain, yeah, they do the same thing every night and they, you know what the definition of insanity is. Mm -hmm. But Brain has this drive, this compulsion, this mission, and so does Batman. So there is a kind of... Batman wants to save the world and, and fight crime and... Pinky brain wants to rule it. But does this also then mean that Babs is the brain <laughs> of the operation? Because when she becomes Oracle, she clearly is. She's the nerve center. She's the one not just for Batman, but for basically the entire heroic DC universe. She's their nerve center and their, their tech wizard. So there's a lot there when you think about it. I mean, she will inherit that role after she has that terrible, terrible, tragic uh, accident happen to her. Let's go with that. Um, I think there's definitely a, a sign of that kind of recognition, but that's just her having given herself an unfortunate prophecy. That's not necessarily what she meant. I really said that's not what she meant. But she's definitely smart, and that's oh, yeah. one of my favourite things about yeah. her. And, uh, undoubtedly so and we were talking about the quality of the performances I think there was a quality of the performance the combination mm. of great voice work and great animation in yeah. that particular moment at the beginning Absolutely. when Batgirl swoops in because like Bruce Wayne stays when, every, when the whole building is evacuated and the place is still burning Bruce Wayne stays and there is genuine pride there on his face as he sees her swoop in unprompted because even for an event like that she still had her gear with her somewhere she didn't look like she had a bag 
but still had it with her and was still able to like swoop in and save the day, but still stay true to herself by like being like, hi, big fan. Can you, can you sign this after? Yeah, stuff like stuff like that. Absolutely. And did you like me feel when that was going on? Because that's why Bruce really stayed. Well, partially he was also to protect his girlfriend, but part of the reason he was there was he was dying for an opening to get there to save Cassidy, to save lives, to do something. But he couldn't because he was in full Bruce Wayne guys. Mm. And he even said, you know, thank goodness you were here. I mean, Barbara literally swooped in like an Avenging Angel and smashed it. It was brilliant. It really was. And I think moments like that are proof to Batman that his taking on of these youngsters, a lot of people would call that really reckless, but most of the time they do good heroics and it does work out they're as capable as he is and that's mm. something this particular season mm. has shown really well so well i mean i mean let, let's talk about then batman himself because i think this was a really strong batman episode particularly mm. showing every aspect of the character once again brilliant bruce wayne moments the proud mentor I want to talk about the scene where he first comes across Firefly and obviously Firefly shoots through the roof, breaks through the uh, skylight and Batman fires the grappling gun, wraps it around his legs. The, obviously the villain's surprised, but nice touch, flaming sword, Azrael, eat your heart out, fire saber, mm. wicked. But Batman's knowledge of the city, because when his rope's cut, Mm -hmm. He knows there's a flagpole there. He knows yeah. there's an awning there. And this is why he wears the cape. People always say Batman's cape is, is dumb. I'm sorry. It's 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 perfection because A, the silhouette is unmistakable. The shadow, the darkness, the fear. But that glider thing, if he had not had that cape, he might not have made it to that awning, which saved his life. And him saying, I live, is a pure sign of his knowledge of this, this city is matchless he knows where everything is and that's what saved him i think also this might be to my mind the first time we actually see batman use the cape for like parachuting and gliding like at least properly there's probably in the been, show yeah definitely yeah there's been instances of it like swishing to be able to like break his fall and stuff but him to actually like actually catch some air with it yeah i think this is the first time it's done that and it's a real nice thing to see because that way we sh uh, see that in combination with him like sticking the landing an impossible landing but it's not even that because he had the second like grappling hook but even then it didn't quite catch and then he swung but he knew that he, if he had aimed it right then he'd hit the flagpole and then swing down and then hit the awning so yeah his not knowledge of the city is like unmatchable it really is it's it's superb and it's a character moment that again other media doesn't seem to grasp it's only the comic books in this series that get all these aspects of the character case in point in the cave later where barbara's injured and there's just a moment which was completely not necessary at all but i'm so glad it's there where he steps out of the shadows and he walks up to barbara and good old alfred taking care of babs and saying looking at bruce and seeing his, his costumes worn the capes torn and says shouldn't you go out in something a bit more durable and i thought uh oh are we gonna get a classic Batman emergency costume moment, and boy, do we. Another vintage part of the character. See now, I really like that, uh, let's go with power armour, fire-resistant power armour. Love armor. it. Because I think functionality-wise, if it had just been upgraded a lot with whatever futuristic sci-fi tech that the DC Universe has access to, in my heart and in my mind, I feel like that's like a precursor prototype to the Batman Beyond suit. You took the thoughts <laughs> right out of my brain. I was thinking the exact same thing. Yeah, I was going to be one of my big sort of takeaways, but I've got another one. We'll save that for the end. It's all good. But yeah, it it totally could be because that's very much a product of like sci-fi, like almost nowish, where thing where robots are chunky and bulky, and power suits have like all kinds of things like built into them, like Iron Man's suit from Marvel Comics and stuff. So that's how that would look, but then that technology gets refined down and down and down to the nanotech and the nano thread fibers and the stuff built into the linings of it. That could be the Batman Beyond suit, or at least I'd like it to be. Absolutely, definitely, definitely a precursor to the Batman Beyond suit, which was again a takeaway that I was going to help with. But again, I've got loads from this episode. This episode blew my mind. I absolutely loved it. So, I mean. <sighs> 
I, I want to say that what I loved about this episode, because we haven't credited um, the writer or, or director yet, and I have to. Mm-hmm. This is Rich Fogel, I think's finest hour. The, the writing in this episode, the hints, the nods, the, the things he mentions. And as I said, animation wise, this episode was phenomenal. Kurt Gator, the director, smashed it out of the park. Um, but I want to talk about the writing in particular, where where they find Lindsay's hideout, where he's making all the equipment. And Bab said, this guy's a real firebug. To comics nerds like me, that'll make you smile because before Firefly, there was a character called Firebug who had the garish orange and yellow costume, uh, wait, similar yeah. kind of MO. And having that as a mention was fantastic. Um, the Frank they've called uh, Cassidy's manager Frank, to me, because of the look, is a direct um, homage or possibly tongue in cheek look at Frankie uh, DeLeo, who was Michael Jackson's notorious manager from oh. that era, who the one who put out all the controversial stories into the news just to keep his client in the public eye. Horrible, evil, mm. twisted man. Um, decent actor, though, made a few films. And little things like when Frank says this uh, apartment, no one could get here, even who uh, would have a tough time. And then Batman shows right there. up. Yeah, that was absolutely uh, the huge factory Mephisto, another name for the devil and the flames of hell. Nice little subtle nuances, but my absolute favorite, one of the cops where Bullock has his vintage Bullock moment of just busting in like a Bullock in a China shop into the apartment. One of the cops is called Vincenzo. And that to me, again, comics nerd moment has to be a tip of the hat to classic Batman detective comics writer and editor Darren Vincenzo, who was editor of detective comics from 1993 to 2000, who had his hands on classic storylines like No Man's Land and Contagion and um, all of those. And of course, editor on Batman Adventures. Oh, wow. Adventures, Batman course. and Robin Adventures. So it's little things like that that elevate it because you can watch this and just have a fan, like you said, fantastic, fun time watching it. And then stuff like that for the Ultra Nerds is just oh, perfect. It's really satisfying. And they give that Vincenzo character a good bit of clout on screen because um, he says, oh, yeah, sure, but like, there's going to be plenty of evidence in the fridge, whatever. Um, classic Bullock. <laughs> classic Bullock. Uh, super against regulation, but whatever. I'm not a police officer. Um, but that level of care and attention, a lot of people will miss it. But for those who can appreciate it, and for those who are watching, will be like, hey, then give me a shout out. I love that. It's just good respect, and it's just good ways to show that they understand how big and how deep the the fan base is for Batman across across all time and then for people who understand like music popular culture and what they're trying to homage there they really get that level of care and attention down so that everyone can find something enjoyable and someone to like sort of mirror and remember so they they handle that very well in a way that's very effortless it's not very forced there's ways that it could be forced and unnatural but they do it perfectly here somehow Absolutely. I'm, I'm fairly sure, I can't say for definite because you've got the book, but I'm absolutely positive that the Batman Adventures, the Lost Years graphic novel I've lent you with the origin of Dick Grayson in this universe in Tonight Ring is edited by Darren Vincenzo. I could almost swear to the fact. So let me know once you mm. have a look at that book, whether I, I was I was on the money or not. But um, yeah, little things like that just, just make me happy. So um, clearly, obviously, Batman defeats the villain um, after a huge battle and Barbara gets injured, but they come together in the end and it's just action packed awesomeness, isn't it? It really is. The whole episode I was saying has been very high stakes, high tension, action packed, uh, um, explosive. Let's go. Let's even go with that. But um, because we've had quite a few good thought piece episodes and character driven episodes so it's good to get this one back to its roots that it was back in uh season one where i think we i think i threw the term swashbuckle around a lot so getting back to that not to say any of the other stuff was bad or negative but getting back to that was a nice return to form for this uh for this show and for a great character piece and a great villain to sort of show it off with it's like you say i mean 
none of it's bad. This is one series where I've liked or loved every single one. And even if I had a tiny little niggle or whatever, we've managed to accept it because of how great everything else in the episode is. So, and to me, this one is faultless. I don't have a single negative comment to say about this episode at all. Um, on that note, do you want to do the takeaways or should I talk about the uh, guest cast first? No, no, no. We, uh, we'll, always, we'll give the cast their time in the sun first we, okay. we wrap, and then wrap up with ourselves. Well, let's start from Shannon, Bruce's girlfriend in the episode, who, again, uh, to give this level of character who, as far as I'm aware, doesn't return. But I recognised the voice straight away and I thought, that's a character, that's someone I've heard speak on screen in the past or heard. Well, I had. Um, actress, voice actress, but mainly big uh, pop and rock star of the, of the 90s, specifically in the US. But for me in the UK as well, because even though this country is dominated by pop, I listen to a lot of American rock. Um, Jane Wheedlin. Um from the Hex Girls uh, rock group and Dusk from the Hex Girls being a multi-time appearing character in Scooby-Doo animation. Uh, so her real life personality actually became an, a real life cartoon character as well. Appearing on soundtracks from Pretty Woman all the way to Josie and the Pussycats, but also uh, an accomplished screen actress and voice actress. The fact that um, she was, I don't know if the Clue film, we call it Cluedo here, the Tim Curry film. Oh, yeah. Um, the... Uh, to a singing telegram girl at the front door who has a very no, yeah really that's her yep absolutely she didn't last long bless her but oh. memorable um joan of arc in the bill and ted movie sure and, yeah absolutely but her main claim to fame the thing that most fans will know from as soon as i say is from a band called the go-go's a, a rock chick punk band who launched the career both of Jane and the ultra famous Belinda Carlisle massive hits throughout the 90s and a huge huge deal um actually I think you dig a lot of their music punk rock rocky really really cool stuff so that's the um three or four line bit part of, of the episode sure <laughs> then we Get, go like, to yeah, yeah. amazing no, no, say, talent say, for a bit part tell me about it any every time love that go on yeah then we go to again two of the greatest character actors of, of the fans people i'm huge fans of go to david paymer who played frank the manager movie roles city slickers um tv roles happy days la law taxi cheers he appeared in airplane 2 he appeared in howard the duck movie he appeared in oceans 13 but you and i <laughs> will love him and remember him always as the hello hi how you doing guy from crazy people <laughs> oh crazy people i don't know if it's a movie that's still politically aged well but it was a lot of no, fun i love that movie and it's i love a... him in particular oh hi, how you doing? Hello, hello. Hey, how's it hanging hello yeah. hello hi um then we go on to cassidy herself played by another massive rock name of the era carla devito no relation to danny as far as i'm aware but god spell the musical she toured with meatloaf blue oyster cult Hall of Notes, um, appeared on the soundtrack for Breakfast Club. Um, the We Are Not Alone song is one of the main songs from the from the, from the the show. Um, Legend of Prince Valiant, fantastic uh, adaptation of the newspaper strips. Um, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, uh, one of the great rock voices, collaborated with basically anyone who was a rock musician in the 90s and two hugely successful solo albums of her own. And you could tell that as soon as she started singing, this isn't just someone they got into... Uh, squeal a couple of lines this is a clearly a, a rock singer and i love that that attention to detail in the show i don't think um a show who puts that much love and care and attention into casting their bit parts would skimp on someone to do like vo uh, musical vocals here and there so yeah that level of uh professionalism and care and attention shows again and that's another reason why we love the voice casting and the voice direction done in the show and I've read a book this week called Batman Animated by um, Paul Dini and uh, Chip Kidd. And it's exactly what we thought. Uh, halfway through season one, Andrea Romano's phone didn't stop ringing from people who wanted to appear in the show because they were blown away by it. And that's partly how it happened, that these big names weren't just cast. Um, a lot of them asked and begged and 
they were put forward because they were right for the role because this is how amazing this show is which leads me neatly to the actor who played firefly now you might not recognize the name mark ralston but i did as soon as i saw it and i thought of course one of the finest most beloved character actors both in live action and animation let's talk through some of his credits he's appeared in movies like the shawshank redemption he was Gordy in The Shield, tons of episodes of that brilliant classic procedural show. He was in The Departed, 24. He was Lex Luthor in Young Justice and Deathstroke in Arkham Origins. Ooh. But this is where we all start to know him. Alistair in Supernatural, the demon. Oh, OK. Um, he was a one of the South African thugs, the Neath Weapon 2. But for us... He will always be immortally forever canonized in cinema history as Drake from Aliens. Yeah. So good. Kiss, you're just too bad. Excellent actor. Oh, wow. Again, they just get someone so incredibly tenured to be able to get a strong character across. And... No uh, drip of animation since has done that. Nothing like it. It's Mm -mm. wow. All people. Wow. Okay. Yeah. They've done it again. I mean, this guy from this episode, and he was cast for season one. That's let's not forget that he was cast for season one as Firefly, but Warner Brothers wouldn't let him use it. It's only when they moved channels um, that they opened up the avenues to be a bit more um daring and this episode is definitely that going to the point where let's let's do our takeaways um the the effects of firefly so adam tell us about your main thoughts of this superb episode my my takeaway is quite interesting because i want to talk about the excellent continuity not necessarily in between episodes but between um um this batman animation style media uh, I know you want to talk about that uh, final scene with Cassidy in the uh, restaurant where she has a moment. So re- related to that, unless I'm mistaken, I feel like that high rise restaurant where Cassidy and her agent is, is the exact same restaurant where Bruce Wayne goes on the date with the lady who's revealed to be the phantasm in Mask of the Phantasm. I think you're right, because it had a hugely familiar feel to me as well. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, I recognised like the decor and the high rise buildings and the like the red carpet and the brown walls and tables. It looked similar enough that in my mind it must might be the same. So that level of care and attention to just uh, restage a scene to look exactly like how it was done from a good explanation scene from a different piece of related media is a very bold thing to do there again not a lot of animations would bother or care about doing totally agree with you it's, it's just so many remem- memories for not just continuing what's been done on the show but the links back to the comics like i said so many times over the course of the series and this episode particularly with the with the vincenzo thing and with the costume because that was a takeaway for me as well i said yeah this is batman beyond armor stage one without a shadow of a doubt that big bold bat in the middle the complete face mask it was superb but the other takeaways again is is vintage batman like the first fight where lins is um threatening cassidy and out of nowhere just left of screen one punch and it's that vintage batman comes out of nowhere and it happens so many times afterwards the batarang out of nowhere both barbara and bab uh, barbara and bruce swooping in this is the kind of show you can give anyone. Do you want to see Batman, vintage Batman, every aspect of Batman? You can put this episode in and someone from the age of six to 60 will find something to love about it. It's very hard to get a character as layered as Batman done right every single time. There's so many elements to Batman that so many different creators have done so many different things over the nearly 100 years of the character's existence. Um, however, episodes like this and shows like this are Mm. able to stay true to his roots in multiple different ways that's i think the only thing they don't really handle is um batman's like golden age silliness or adam west silliness but then again the character was never really part of that legends of the dark knights coming up soon Mm, we'll see i suppose (laughs) but um yeah 
an, an ongoing, long-standing, well-handled look and portrait of the character. Yeah. That's what always what the show is, and this episode does that. Not to say any episodes are bad, but this episode does that a little bit better than most. Yeah, this is this is up there. This is one of those bordering on 11 out of 10 episodes for me. Loved it to pieces. The fact that um, I knew from the beginning that, that, that Firefly had been poo-pooed for earlier seasons, and to actually see him, and then this is the first time um, we see him on screen, was just a brilliant piece of history as well. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. So that's it. That was Torch Song, series, episode 10 of season three of Batman the Animated Series, our 89th episode. Next one's the big nine zero. But until next time, let's tell our viewers, viewers listeners, and uh, readers of Fantastic Universe, DC Comics News, and Dark Knight News where they can hear your dulcet tones, read your work, and talk to you. Well, as you said, on those great, great websites for Batman-flavoured things, look no further than... Uh, at least for me, Dark Knight News, I review multiple titles a month. I'm between titles right now. I'm devastated to see Batman Joker Dudley duo end up. But I'm always there to give my two cents on whatever fine stories DC wants to tell at the present. Uh, Catwoman's still in an excellent spot right now. But for my one true love, PC and tabletop game, look to our pride and joy, fantasticuniverses.com, where I give my two cents on tabletop and console and pc gaming and anything else that tickles my fancy talk to me on twitter at is it tinkerer and to listen to my dulcet tones across the fantastic universes podcast network tune into fantastic plays a show where a close friend and i talk about any issue or any spotlight any game that we may want to discuss at that particular time uh bit between uploads at present but uh, i have some good things coming up in the pipeline so do keep your ears out for that talk to me on twitter at is it tinker as you can see above i am up for a pleasant and engaging conversation about just about anything and uh, even though you are in between uh ongoings you've still got catwoman every month but you've done some lovely work with specials and offshoots i'm dying to read your review of uh this year's pride special yeah. and that maps of uh Gotham was a cracking little one shot, lovely, fun little comic. It really was great, great fun. Uh, I look forward to looking more into stories like that and that character. But uh, you can check all of that out on Dark Knight News very, very soon, dear listener. Absolutely. As for myself, uh, tweet me at lstevo, E L underscore S T E E V O on Twitter, where you can also find DC Comics News, Dark Knight News, DK News.com, Fantastic Universes at Fan Universes. Catch us online on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. You can see these faces at the same time you hear these voices. As for my written work, just type Steve J Ray or Fantastic Universe into your search engine of choice to read my news reviews, features and interviews across all three websites. Catch this show and the main DC Comics news podcast on, Tum on Tumblr. No, you can't catch it there at all. Uh, Twitch, <laughs> Stitch, um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you get your podcast fix. But until you do, in the worlds of Batman, there's something you need to remember. I am the knight. We are the knight. And this has been the I Am The Night podcast. Thank you for listening. And until next time, read more comics and watch more Batman. Batman. Batman.